Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Living Well with Prostate Cancer webinar series. And today we'll be talking about sex and intimacy. My name is David James, and I'm the head of patient projects at Prostate Cancer Research. So Prostate Cancer Research, um, as the name suggests, we are a predominantly research-focused charity that is dedicated to improving and saving lives by developing new treatments for advanced prostate cancer. By funding novel and innovative projects at world-leading institutions across the UK, we're working towards breakthroughs in the prevention, the diagnosis, and the treatment of advanced prostate cancer and ensuring better quality of life outcomes for patients. We're very proud to fund 15 research projects in institutions across the UK from Aberdeen, down to Cambridge, Cardiff, Glasgow, London, Newcastle, Norwich, and Oxford, focused on key areas such as radiotherapy, bone metastases, immunotherapy, and AI, all with a shared aim of reducing morbidity, increasing survival rates, and improving quality of life for people affected by prostate cancer. Beyond our research, we're also dedicated to educating, empowering, and supporting our patient, partner, family, and carer communities. And that's why we launched this webinar series back in August. And we're very proud to be doing this in collaboration with our good friends, Tackle Prostate Cancer, who are the UK's National Federation of Prostate Cancer Patient Support Groups. Now, for those of you who are new here today, um, just a few housekeeping points. This is a, a Zoom webinar rather than a, a Zoom meeting, which most of us are probably familiar with. So everyone automatically has their video and uh, microphone sort of muted and off. And that's so we can record this session and then share it with um, share it with yourselves, um, but also share it with others who were not able to join us uh, live here today. There is also no chat function, um, but there is a Q and A section, um, uh, which you you know if you have any questions at any point for our speaker, please feel free to drop them in the Q and A section. And when we open up for questions in the last fifteen minutes of today's session, we will um, address as many of those as we can. So. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, we're joined by Lorraine Grover. Now, Lorraine has over 25 years experience managing patients and their partners regarding sexual issues following a diagnosis of prostate cancer. She is a member of both the British and European Societies of Sexual Medicine. And as a clinical nurse specialist and sex therapist, she's able to uh, manage patients' uh, issues and their partners uh, in a very multi-dimensional multi way. Lorraine has a diploma in psychosexual therapy and for several years worked in the NHS, providing nurse-led erectile dysfunction clinics at St. George's Hospital in London and Wickham Hospital in Buckinghamshire. She sits on the Board of Trustees of the Sexual Advice Association and has also achieved a Developing Practice Award from the Queen's Nursing Institute to develop an information package for patients and partners regarding erectile dysfunction. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce you today to Lorraine. Um, so Lorraine, if you would turn back your video on. Um, there we go. And unmute yourself and you should be able to share your screen. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. Um, let me see that hopefully I can get the share screen going. Aha, can you all see it? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Looking and feeling great. Well, we all would like to feel like that. And sometimes life throws swerve balls at us. And, and we don't. And prostate cancer can be a huge swerveball thrown at people, which can impact on you as an individual um, or your partner um, if you're in a relationship. So hopefully in the next 45 minutes, I'll be able to share some information with you. I, I've, I think I've got the best job in the world and I'm very lucky to be able to talk to men, predominantly men, but there are other people I appreciate with prostates. But in my career over the past 20 odd years, um, when I speak one to one with somebody, I really have the opportunity to find out what really is having an impact for them. Um, so let's move on and hopefully I can. Aha, there we go. So this slide here. Religion, politics and sex, and Lloyds Bank allowed me to use this for the purpose of my lectures. This caught my eye. I was on a train and seeing those three words certainly caught my eye. And, um, and talking about money can be a difficult thing to talk about, but I would absolutely say sex can be as well. And 
around us, we've had beautiful artwork, still continue to have beautiful artwork. That's just that reminder sometimes as we're walking around about the human form. And Bernie Zilbergeld has written an excellent book called The New Male Sexuality, which I've referenced at the end. And he talks about good sex usually takes place within the context of a good relationship. And it's a really important factor that because sometimes people are not in good relationships when they have ill health anyway. Um, so, you know, thinking about your circumstances prior to your prostate cancer diagnosis is part of that holistic management. You just don't present with your prostate. Is sex important? Well, I would say it absolutely is. Not only am I saying it, but the World Health Organization, who I've quoted at the top here about it being a fundamental human right. And we shouldn't be fearful of it. We shouldn't be shameful about asking for help about that. And we know that organic disease has an impact on sexuality. So here we are, the WHO saying it. So hopefully that allows you to feel confident to ask your healthcare professionals about the help and advice that you may need. David Bailey, last year when I was reading the paper, was saying about he's 83, but he still likes it. And, you know, age is no barrier to asking for help or feeling sexual. Our psychological well-being is as important as our physical well-being. And we can express sexuality in many ways. It's not just about intercourse. It's caressing. It's holding hands. It might just be that language that you have with somebody that's different, that makes that relationship special. And it's certainly good for our self-esteem. So nice guidelines came out in 2008. And I thought, fantastic. You know, we've got these guidelines and everyone will get all this happening. This is a good thing to look at to help you understand what your, your sort of rights in care and what input you should ask for because we've got nice National Institute of Clinical Excellence that put these together and they've been reviewed over years in 14 and in 19 and it talks about individual needs it should be early and ongoing that help that you get and it includes psychosexual and erectile dysfunction services and also thinking about the people in your care team who are helping you with the care, they should be experienced and certainly experienced in dealing with psychosexual issues. And that's why I trained as a psychosexual therapist, because it came quite clear to me that in my erectile dysfunction clinic many years ago at St. George's, that actually men had um, or penis, there was a man attached, there may be a relationship, and it actually really had an impact on someone's psychology. And sort of a buzzword that's come about is euro-oncology or sexologists. And we're starting to hear the words more frequently because it's an important part of cancer care. We had a quality standard come about as well. Again, repeating from NICE guidelines about what input we should be providing for patients. I do think we've got to change attitudes. Um, I was asked in the spring of this year to write an article for the Eurostomy Association Journal and the editor got in touch with their um, readers to feed in information with this. And it was overwhelming the number of people who said that sexuality was not being addressed and how important it was to them. So it's a bit like the elephant in the room, I say, that we should be addressing it with all patients, irrespective of age, and gender, and we should have it as part of care right from the very beginning of diagnosis. So this is me part of a team. Um, I've got my white glasses on on the left. That's when I was part of a trauma team when I was a casualty sister. And over on the right, I'm sat down with my orange top on. And that was me part of the penile cancer team. Um, and I often say, if you think of this triangle, we talk about the cancer, obviously, and you want to survive and get through and have this treatment dealt, this is disease dealt with. And continence is frequently spoken about so easily, but very little is mentioned about sexuality. So actually, I put in two C's here, cock and clitoris, because if we think about these four C's, it's an easy thing to remember. And trauma is very much how it can feel to you when things have changed to what you've been used to. 
whether that's in your relationship, that whether that's with masturbation, um, it can feel like there's a loss. And I've had lots of men describe that to me over the years. We know that you want the healthcare professionals to initiate the discussion. And I would say that some of the lack of that happening is I, I, I know that big people say, oh, it's like lifting the can of worms or open up the tin and we haven't got the time or I don't know what to say. And it mirrors slightly as well with patients that sometimes you might feel, I don't know what to first ask the question about. I don't know the language to feel confident to do that. So hopefully by the end of this session, you may feel more empowered to do so. So having information improves our knowledge base and it relieves anxiety, it gives us confidence. You might hear a lot said about prehabilitation in cancer care lately, and it's usually around exercise or being fit for surgery. And I would say that the prehabilitation should also be around sexuality and sexual issues that we should assess and get a baseline. So communication is really important. Now, I did not know until last Christmas, actually, when I bought the bauble on the left, that that was the emoji for a penis and aubergine. So it just made me think, if I didn't know that, there are lots of words we might use to describe sex, to describe parts of our anatomy, that we may not actually know what they mean. So when I was um, did this feature earlier on in the year, you know, we spoke about, well, it's interesting, the people who, who put this together did an aubergine on the front cover. And then I thought, oh, I know what that's all about. So communication is really important. If you're not sure about anything that a healthcare professional is saying to you, ask them. When I ask patients and partners about sex, if I'm not sure about something, I ask them. So we really understand what the needs are that need to be met. We are all different. And I think when people describe the treatments for prostate cancer, often people can be given a list of negative side effects. But it's about your experience. And that's what's important. And that about our ignorance about what to do is the major barrier. Now, getting any man into clinic can be quite difficult. And if there are any partners on, on this um, webinar, you might know how difficult it felt to get the person you're with, with prostate cancer to go to get some help. So I use this as my little opportunity for a couple of slides here about risk factors and erectile dysfunction, because men may present with erectile dysfunction following treatment and management of prostate cancer, but there's a high incidence of men who have erectile dysfunction anyway. As a trustee of the Sexual Advice Association, we know that one in 10 men have erectile dysfunction. 50% of diabetic men have erectile dysfunction. So it may already pre-exist. And it can be a warning sign for things like underlying cardiac disease. So this is a really important infographic to think about. And about talking to somebody to get the help and to get the management, because there's lots of treatments that you'll see soon about what's available for you to try. And there can be a mixture. So you can see on this slide here with the two circles, organic means illness, ill health, and psychogenic is the psychological. And there's an overlap. So diabetes, vascular disease, um, heart disease, pelvic surgery, Peyronie's disease, which is curvature in the penis that can develop. And that can happen to men anyway, but also men who have a radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer, have a high incidence of Peyronie's disease that can develop. And we don't exactly know why that is, but sometimes people get this fibrous tissue and it makes their penis bend in a, in a different way. Um, so these things can overlap because actually, if you're not having good sexual experience or it's difficult to get an erection, it can produce performance anxiety. It can impact on a relationship and it can certainly make people feel depressed and stressed. And I do think there's been a lot more now spoken about, about mental health and suicide risk in men. And we know it's much higher in the population. 
So it's a really important thing. And I don't think we address enough about men's health and mental health, and we should be. So be mindful of that. You're not unusual to feel like you're feeling if that's happening to you. So please talk and communicate to somebody. Now, prostate cancer research and tackle in May showed that nearly 80% of men who are treated for prostate cancer experience erectile dysfunction, ED, it's known as as well, or loss of libido. And I just want to mention the two papers briefly at the bottom, which you can look online and read in detail. And although it says it's a guide for health professionals, I think to bring about this change and improve care, you, the patients, are able to bring about change often. And if you know what you're able to ask for and what advice there is, it helps you, it empowers you and gives you that knowledge. Not only is it for people who have surgery, which is the one on the left, but the one on the right talks about people on androgen deprivation therapy. And historically, when I started this job years ago, it was really the surgical patients, patients the patients who'd had a radical prostatectomy, they were the ones getting the input around sexuality. But actually, hormone patients are just as needy of, the, of, those, of that input. Um, you can't turn the clock back. The cells within the penis can die, and they would call that apoptosis. And so actually, keeping the penile tissue as healthy as possible is a really important part of penile rehabilitation or even prehabilitation if you've got pre-existing ED. I love the power of social media. I mean, David and I met, if I remember rightly, I think that was through social media, seeing, seeing each other. I met Ian Smith, who's a gentleman who has had prostate cancer, and he actually then felt empowered to go off and do a photographic course and have this wonderful artwork that he did He's had this um, shown up north, he's from the north, and, um, and I'm in the south, so I'm very keen to try and get this artwork rotated around in the south to help raise awareness. And here you can see, and you, again I've referenced it at the end, the impact that prostate cancer had on these people um, in their relationships and how each of them felt. So take a peek, you know, help you realise that you're not alone with some of the thoughts that you may be having. So what management options are there for erectile dysfunction? Because that is the predominant main sexual dysfunction that is, is mentioned a lot. But remember, there are other issues like not being able to orgasm. You might leak urine when you orgasm, and we call that climacteria. You might get what we call penile atrophy, and you get some shortening of the penis. So these management options, at the very top, I've put the things that are quite simple to think about. And it might be lifestyle change. It might be that the treatments that you're having are causing fatigue and you're trying to be intimate at a time when you're exhausted. So actually just reflecting, taking stock of when do you have that time to feel relaxed enough to try a sexual encounter with yourself, with masturbation or with a partner. And I've put the psychosexual therapy and the rehab down each side of the triangle. But if we move from lifestyle, we've got combination therapy. So we might combine some of the treatments below in the triangle um, with other things. There's a vacuum constriction device. There are drugs we can use. There's a cream, there's a pellet. There are injections and there's a penile implant. So let's have a look at these in a bit more detail. Now to get the treatment, Schedule 2 came about in 98 when it was called Schedule 11. And the government said, we are not treating all men with erectile dysfunction with NHS prescriptions. We are going to limit it. So they brought out Schedule 11. It was then reviewed years later and renamed Schedule 2. And you can see in orange, I've put prostate cancer and people who've had their prostate removed because that entitles you as a guideline to get four treatments a month as an NHS prescription. And it also includes a vacuum constriction device. But I know, and I think some of you might be shouting at the screen even, that doesn't happen where I live. It has become very much a postcode lottery as to who is getting these as an NHS prescription. 
and even how many tablets people are getting. When the schedule first started, Viagra, Sildenafil, was very expensive. And so it was limited to this four tablets a month. But you can see on this slide that actually in 14, Pfizer who owned Viagra, it became generic. So it was a lot cheaper. And schedule two was actually reviewed and this was changed to include general sildenafil, generic sildenafil and not restrict it to four tablets. Now I only found this out because I was lecturing at the Royal College of GPs and whilst I was prepping my slides I thought I'll just revisit some of the input I've put in and that's when I found it. So it was kept very much under the radar. And then we've now got generic Tadalafil, <clears throat> excuse me, which is the name of Cialis. And we've also got over-the-counter Viagra. But the over-the-counter Viagra is very specific and it's only 50 milligram. Yes, you can go into chemist to buy it. You might see adverts for it. But the pharmacist who prescribes has got a very strict protocol to follow. Um, so being mindful of that, it's only 50 milligram and it is a bit more expensive. There's a bit of fun here, just have a little think, which one of these four things from my kitchen um, do you think's got a link with an erectile dysfunction treatment? Um, and hopefully all will become clear. So tablets, we've got several available and they're called phosphodiesterase type five inhibitors because they work on this number five enzyme in penile tissue. And as I've mentioned, in the brackets is the brand name, which tend to be more expensive than the generic name, which is the first name that you see. So for penile rehabilitation, it's often advised that men start taking five milligram daily to Dalafil when the catheter is removed. There are some thoughts and some research looking at doing daily to Dalafil pre-surgery. Um, but you start taking this tablet every day at the same time, that's really important. And you must take it for at least five days to reach the steady level of the drug in your bloodstream. That helps to normalize if you're going to be able to get an erection or not. You don't have that performance anxiety of thinking, oh, I'm gonna be sexually active or not, do I need, need to take the tablet? But I have found that in men who have a radical prostatectomy, Often that daily dose doesn't help them to get a good erection, but it could be helping at cell structure. So sometimes people think there's no point me taking it because I'm not seeing an outcome, but it's more at the molecular level. And you can add an additional 20 milligram, which is a maximum dose of Tadalafil, on top if clinically, the clinician that you're speaking with, there are no risks involved with that. So if you're not getting a response of an erection with a five milligram daily dose, there's very low risk of you developing what we call a priapism, which is a medical emergency when an erection lasts for more than four hours. And that's why sometimes combining drugs is not ideal. And also there've been no studies done on combining drugs. So seeing an expert is a really important factor to this. You know, you've really got to understand the methodology behind the treatments. The maximum dose of sildenafil is 100 milligram. And because sildenafil is more well known in some ways, that tends to be a drug that's used quite a lot. So sometimes the original trials were done with 25 milligram of sildenafil at night when you went to bed, and then you would add 100 milligram before sexual activity if that 25 milligram didn't, you know, wasn't effective. What's brilliant about these drugs is um, they, with, with touching, with sexual stimulation, they help you get an erection. So it's very much like it would be when you were able to get erections that you needed sexual stimulation, either visual or auditory to listen to something to turn you on. And it gives you this natural erection. You do have to be careful if you take nitrate drugs, which are tablets that can relieve chest pain. GTN is a popular one that people put a tablet under their tongue and it dilates the vessels to release, relieve the pain. And these tablets drop pupil pressure slightly. And because the side effect can be facial flushing, 
people tend to think it's because their blood pressure has gone up, but that's absolutely not true. It makes it go down. So excellent drugs around to think about. But sometimes I've put this plaster picture on because if you're a man with erectile dysfunction and you're taking this, do you know what the cause is of your erectile dysfunction if you think back to the risk factors? And so it might be a bit like sticking an elastoplast on. So if you've got your mates down the pub saying about, oh yeah, I'm taking Viagra or Cialis, you know, just be a bit mindful to get themselves checked out. Topical alprostadil. Now, alprostadil is, um, this is a gel and it's in this little applicator that you can see. Um, and I've got a little one in my hand here. And with this, you take the cap off. It's kept in the fridge. It seems to work better if you rub it between your hands to warm slightly. And then you open up the glands. This goes over the top and then you press down on this plunger and you allow the, the cream, sort of gel slash cream to drip into your urethra. And whatever's left on the top, you would rub. And that can help some men to get an erection. If I go back and just mention something about the tablets, if you've had a radical prostatectomy, the tablets, <clears throat> excuse me, they need the nerves to be working. And sometimes the nerves go into a shock state and we call that neuropraxia. So the signaling to your penis is, is disrupted. You may have sexual thoughts and feel quite horny, but the signaling to your penis to help the tablets to become effective is disrupted. So tablets frequently, how well they work, drops quite significantly in men who've had a radical prostatectomy. The topical alprostadil, because that you're applying it to the penis directly, it doesn't need the nerves to be working. So that's a good thing to remember that these next drugs that I'm talking about can work if at the time it's early from surgery and you've got neuropraxia, there may be time needed for the nerves to settle. And there's lots of evidence that early intervention for penile rehabilitation, the better the long-term outcome can be. So I like people starting medication as soon as the catheter's removed and moving on to alprostadil within three months from surgery. And there's lots of evidence about that. Muse medicated urethral system is a pellet that you apply into the penis. And with Muse, it comes in an applicator like this, and you would keep this in the fridge, but it works better at room temperature, so you can keep it out of the fridge. And you go to the loo beforehand and lubricate so your penis is wet. And then you pull the cap off. Don't touch the end because it's sterile. Because you've weed, your urethra is wet, and then you slip this down. And then as you can see here on this picture, you press the button at the top down. There's a little click there and that pushes out the pellet and you can see a little yellow pellet, which is the, um, the pellet sitting in your urethra. And when you bring the applicator back out, wiggle it slightly back and forth to make sure the pellet stays in there and it doesn't come back out with the applicator. And then you roll the penis back and forth to help that pellet dissolve into your penis, into the two cylinders that run through the penis called your corpus cavernosa. I have a variety of penises and I just had a quick look, but I haven't got the one to hand showing the corpus cavernosa. I might be able to find it before the end of the session. Injection therapies, oh, I love them. They raise the dead. <laughs> they work so well because you're administering the drug directly into the corpus cavernosa so that it allows your penis to get hard. And when that can happen within five to 10 minutes. So I inject lots of people because actually of all the drugs, if I was a gambling woman and I had to say which treatment's going to work the best on any man who's had treatment for prostate cancer, I put my money on a penile injection. But I totally get it sounds so daunting, the thought of putting that needle into your penis. But it really is a very fine needle. And if any of you are diabetic, I'm just going to try and put that up to the camera. It's a little difficult. It's so fine to see. 
but it's like pricking your finger with a rose thorn when that goes in. Um, and you have to titrate the dose. You go with a low dose and gradually increase it to reduce the risk of priapism. And the main drugs are, are prostadil. Here we've got the brand names, Cavajet, Cavajet Dual Chamber and Viridal Duo. And then the fentolamine mesolate and abiptodil is a drug called Invicor. Um, so if men get pain with alprostadil, Invicorp is a good drug to use. Um, Invicorp has to be kept refrigerated, whereas alprostadil doesn't in its injection form. Um, so injections are fabulous. And you rotate the injection site, because if you keep injecting on the same side, um, you can get fibrosis and the, thin, the skin can thicken. Um, so I always say the midpoint is like 12 o'clock and the bottom at six o'clock is where your urethra is. But at 10 o'clock and two o'clock positions, you alternate your injection site. So they're fantastic drugs. Vacuum constriction device, there are several on the market. A handheld one is really good. This is one that I have and you attach the pump to the cylinder and you pump. And just slowly, if you use it standing up, you get a good seal against the body. And as you pump, you create a negative pressure by sucking air out and your penis lifts up and goes hard. And then hold that for 20 seconds, press the release valve and you will go soft. And that's exercising. So that's like physiotherapy to the penis because it's just sitting in your pants. It can get shorter and smaller. It can sometimes cause surgery, but not always, but certainly it's like, anything you know if we don't move our limbs and we don't exercise we lose our muscle tone so using a vacuum is an important part of management and is really important men on um, hormone treatment and you also get constriction rings so this one has three rings and um, these two come as routine and what would happen is you would put the ring you stretch the ring onto the end here and then when you're erect within the cylinder you flip the ring onto the base of the penis. So that will hold at the end here. And the penis is erect from where the band is to the end because it's sucked blood in, but it's a bit hinged because normally, I'll show you on here, your penis is erect because this bit, the penis here is deep in the pelvis. That's why doing your pelvic floor exercises is really good as well. And this is the only part of the penis that you see. So if you've got a ring here on the end, this bit's hinged, hanging down. So you've got to lift it up to get it in um, wherever you want to. Vagina, mouth, bottom. Right, let's move on. Implants. There are inflatable rods, which you can see on the bottom picture, the two cylinders, um, and inflatable at the top. The malleable rods, when I was little, I used to have a Mickey Mouse and it bent its arms. And that's what a malleable rod is like. They get inserted into the penis by a surgeon who's very skilled at this job and has to size it correctly. And then you either move the penis forward or down in whatever position you want. But you've always got an erection there because you feel the malleable rods. The, the inflatable, the reservoir sits in the abdomen, the pump sits in your scrotum, and then those um, long cylinders, which is where your corpus cavernous were, these two long cylinders, they get fitted in. And I would say that if you're not happy with where you are with whatever treatment, certainly I feel three to four years down the line, because it can take that long for there to be recovery of your function. This is something you should certainly be thinking about or, or start to get some questions asked or understand a bit more about it, maybe a little bit in advance in case this is something that you want to do um, because it can be very successful for some men. Um, so implants are another treatment option. So I've mentioned a little bit as I've been speaking about the effects of, of treatment on sexuality and some of them um, I've mentioned are physical but there's also the emotional changes and I think that's where that bit where I said about being privileged and men talking to me about how it affects them and often they feel very isolated and I will say you're not the only person to feel like that I've had other men say this 
And again, it's putting your hand up and saying, you know what, I need some help here. I just need to talk to somebody about this. Because it can affect individuals, it can affect the relationship. I always encourage patients to attend any appointment with their partner, but especially if there's one regarding sexuality. Because that elephant in the room, you don't want to hurt the person that you love or you're in the relationship with. And it's easy to not say anything. But actually, for somebody to hear, actually, I really miss the kissing and the hugs, sitting on the sofa together. It might be something like watching the telly or a football match or Strictly and having a mutual thing that you both agree to do together has stopped because you're worried about, you know, that little caress or kiss might lead on to something else and you won't feel like you can do that. I tell you, that is so valuable. It's the glue in a relationship. And so it's so important that you do talk about that emotional change. Um, this picture here, I got permission from this artist. I saw this picture, George Michael was selling it. Well, he wasn't sadly, he died, but it was at Christie's that I stumbled across one day in London. And there it was huge and it filled the wall. And I just thought, wow, look at that. Men will sometimes say to me, I would rather be functioning as a man and have a shorter life than be where I'm at now. That's a very powerful statement, isn't it? But actually, sex is really important to some people. Um, some clinicians might say, oh, they're not bothered about that. They're more bothered about getting rid of the cancer. Yes, I hear that. But you never know when you feel you need the help. And if you know who to speak to in your team or signpost to speak to, that sex is on your radar it makes you feel complete as a whole person and about that looking and feeling great we spoke about at the very beginning. Um, I love this. I bought this print because, again, it's about communication. You know, what's going on here? The guy's really pleased his football team scored, but his partner underneath, well, maybe he, she thinks he's being orgasmic. Um, but the artist, Tim Bulmer, who um, did this, I loved what he'd written here. Again, it's somebody I've now met on social media because I actually got permission to use this, even though I bought it. And he was saying here on his website about um, the diversity of life and it being a whisker away from a farce. And humour can be used about sexual difficulties. And so, you know, it's just, let's normalise this discussion. Um, I love this analogy. It's like cooking pasta, I always say. We start off with our desire phase. Our brain is the biggest sex organ. It makes us feel horny and we then get aroused. And when we get aroused, we get this vasodilation of blood into our lips, our ears, breasts, clitoris, the penis, the scrotum. As we get aroused, we then stay in a phase of we like the feeling. I'd like a bit more of that. I feel really aroused and that plateau phase from women can stay longer. So it's a bit like the pasta. If you put the pasta in the pan, you cook it too high, the water splashes out the pan and your pasta's not cooked. You want this nice, gentle rolling boil for about five, six minutes for your plateau phase for it to be cooked. Men's plateau phase tend to be shorter than women's. So again, it's very much, you know, it's like a dance, isn't it? You've got to get to know what each person wants. It's not just a tick box. When we're in our plateau phase, we can then move on to our orgasmic phase. And that can vary between people as well. And then the resolution phase, when the blood just drains back into the body and then we're not aroused and we're all ready to start again whenever we get that desire again. So I like that analogy. So the changes that can happen, well, for some in that relationship, it can actually put a wedge and put people apart when prostate cancer is diagnosed, let alone the treatments. Sometimes it pulls people together and they'll go, wow, come on, this is time to focus and we're going to work through this together. And it can make some people reflect on where they're going. I was retiring. We were going to move abroad. Actually, let's take stock of where we are as a couple or as an individual. We use our senses all the time, don't we? Sight, smell, sound, taste. I put perfume on today. You can't smell me. But I always squirt a bit of perfume on. I've got my work perfume. And for me, that puts me my headspace into a nice frame of mind. So senses for sex are as you would for food. You know, we look at something, 
we taste something, do we like it? So thinking about when sex was good, what was good about it? What can you bring into your sexual repertoire that you may have dropped off the radar? To bring in the intimacy, how we feel about our body, how was that now since I've had my treatment? And some men may say, actually, you know, if I leak urine, climacteria, um, it makes the sheets well. My partner doesn't like it. And I go, but you know what? It's sterile. Don't worry about it. Put a towel underneath. Have a nice bowl of water, flannel. Have it there ready. Don't let it stop you from being intimate. Um, I don't want people to feel isolated and angry. And that's really how a lot of people felt in my old job when I was a casualty sister. You know, people dropped down dead or had a major stroke. And it was, why has this happened? So actually, you know, all of us, you could say it for COVID, we've all had things happen in life, but we've got to think, how are we going to get around that? How can we manage it and manage our expectations? The Sexual Advice Association, um, we have got lots of fact sheets on our website. We're the only charity of its type, which I'm very proud of. There are five trustees and we have got on it a smart questionnaire. We did have it as an app, but it was costing us too much. So we've actually uploaded it onto our website and it's free and you can, and it's confidential. So you can go on, you can follow your way through clicking on the questions and it will give you advice that you can ask your healthcare professional, tips about treatment options. And we've got lots of different fact sheets and we've actually got a booklet that I was involved in writing um, quite a few years ago now, which I've referenced at the end. And it's about intimacy and sexuality for cancer patients and their partners. And you can read it, what cost you a bean. Um, I would like to update it, but it's a really good resource, I think, and it's free. And so hopefully it will help people to, to um, get more input. You know, being relaxed is really important. I spoke about the brain being the biggest sex organ, um, using breathing exercises and mindfulness and being in the moment. And lots of sex therapists may use these sort of things, talking to patients about um, relaxing for sex. Um, sometimes it's dispelling myths. There's still a big taboo about masturbation for anybody, and there shouldn't be. It's part of life. It helps us realize how our body is since we've been ill. It might help us sleep better. It might feel us more sexy. There are many reasons why we masturbate. Um, I talk about normal sexual response. I give people exercises to do, as do other sex therapists, but they're all done in your comfort of your home. <laughs> Nothing's done in front of anybody because it's a bit of a scary word when you hear psychosexual therapist. I used to feel scared thinking, sex therapist, what are they all about? But I met a sex therapist who inspired me to do the training. And you realise actually a lot of it is about communication, but it's an area that we we're comfortable talking about, but generally in society, people aren't. Sex toys, you know, people will go, oh, I I've never used them. Why should I? I'll feel abandoned if I'm a partner and I'm using a sex toy. Sex toys do not have a voice. They're not warm. Well, they can be warm, but it's not a person. It's just something that sometimes you can use in sexual activity. When you're exhausted using a sex toy, can make things a little bit easier for you. And there are lots of sex toys. Uh, yeah, thinking out the box. This is a clitoral stimulator um, that you can use and you just put this over the clitoris and it sucks and it's lovely. Um, you can get sex toys in supermarkets. This was one from a supermarket. Things don't always have to go inside. This was from a shop that sells things for a pound. Again, things don't always have to go inside. Back on the slides here, um, those little rainbow colored silicon things are called all nuts. And you can stretch them and you can put them on a penis to prevent deep penetration. I've got vaginal dilators on here um, that you can see because again, sometimes partners may not have had sex for a long time and would like to think about having sex, but they're fearful of it. So you could use a finger or you could use a tiny little vibra, um, little dilator you can see at the very back there. Um, using lubricants is really important. 
If we can move on to the next slide, please, David. Safe sex is really important. This was me on the train a few weeks ago. Um, you know, you might be in new relationships. Um, sometimes older people have got time to be sexual during the day and have opportunities. Just remember safe sex and using um, condoms appropriately. Move on, please. Thank you. Um, I love this advert. I saw it going back to the railway station. I live in books and that was on the way to Marleybone. And I just thought how lovely it was. You know what? Sex is for any age. It's not about being fit, young and primed, isn't it? With false boobs and me mega white teeth. It's about real human beings. And whatever age you are, it feels nice to have touch. Sex with Cancer launched in October. And it's a website that they are patients who've had um, cancer and they are designing their own website and they've got some beautiful videos on that I really advise you to look at. Move on please. Um, this was a little picture here about playtime and I was on about Christmas is coming up and um, sex toys can be for any gender. There are all different types. Um, there's a, a tenger egg you can see on one picture that men can use and it stretches down. It's silicone, it changes the feel of what's going on. You can get bullet vibrators. This is a little one that's an organic one, actually, would you believe? Um, it can biodegrade. Um, and there's a lipstick one that you can see there. It does look like a lipstick, but that's a little vibrator. And there's one here that you can take off. You lube inside and then a man can actually put their penis in here and use that for masturbation. So there's lots around. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a shopping basket. I was at a supermarket, bought my bits I needed and then spotted these. So I bought them just to show how easy it is. You know, they're not that expensive. You can get one, try it out, have it as a bit of fun. If it causes a row, you know, why did that happen? Or actually, okay, it's not going to work for us, fling it or pass it on to someone else and give it a good clean. <laughs> but there are, you can get them from all over the show. Look around bandages and elastoclasts in supermarkets. Your eyes will be opened. Lubricants, be mindful of. Some of the lubricants will have, can have irritants in, such as like a sugar form in it or, um, other preservatives so if you get any vulval irritation you should stop using it and I've listed some in my presentation and yes there's an organic range there's Hylofen which is a vaginal moisturizer we can move on please um, this is a reading list of some of the um, information that I've spoken about and some of the resources that I get patients to look at thank you next slide please um, this, here we are. So that was me, my Christmas jumper last year. And these are some websites that I get my things from because when I'm showing people, I always like to have an array that I can talk about. Um, so you can have a look at these. Um, the sexwithcancer.com that I alluded to that opened in October online is sort of, they've put packages together through shushlife.com. Um, but some of them will have offers on as well for Christmas. So there we go. Next slide, please. Um, and that's me. And that's the thing about the erection connection, which I have been absolutely reinvigorated to visit because I got my Queen's Nursing Institute for this um, erection connection. And it's a flip chart. And at the time, it's when CD-ROMs were available. And my idea was that could be given in primary care to a man who presented with erectile dysfunction and it would give them a resource, but I wanted it to have a signer on. Um, and there wasn't enough funding at the time to do that. But I have to say, watching Giovanni and Rose on Strictly, and I wear hearing aids, has really made me think I've got to get that, make my mission happen. And I would love to redo that with signing, because how do we reach out to people with hearing difficulties, with visual impairment? So my erection connections on my website, and it's got some information there that hopefully can help you. I hope you found that helpful. And let's move on to any questions that I may have. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, that was really very interesting and, and insightful and I know just seeing some of the the questions coming in that um I am am I'm not alone in thinking that um so let's uh get going with some questions um 
The first one actually was was something um, that you've, you raised earlier, um, and I wonder if you might suggest um, if someone is is struggling to start that conversation with a healthcare professional. Do you have any advice on maybe what sort of language they could use, or sort of, sort of questions they might be able to use that at least would help um, get over that first barrier? Yeah, I think you could, even if you say, "Look, I've I've been reading about prostate cancer, and I know it can affect my sexual." performance how I feel about sex do you have anyone on your team that can help me with that and script it write it down on a bit of paper and practice how you're going to say it when you think you will say it and and make it happen you know if you go through in your head what you're going to say it will make it a lot easier so I would certainly advise you to do it like that fantastic no, that's a really great piece of advice um just very quickly also to let people know um if you if you have a question but you don't want um, you know your name to be attached to it, and I, I I'm not going to be telling anyone anyone's names who's put a question in, and obviously everything you write to us is entirely confidential. But there is a, a button you can click that you can ask the question anonymously. So if, you know if you are concerned about anything, um, you you and you want to ask a question, you are allowed to ask it anonymously as well. So just just wanted to let you know about that. And that's a really important point. As a sex therapist, I do a confidentiality agreement with all patients that it's a safe environment because you need to feel safe whoever you're speaking to and obviously any healthcare professional should adhere to the confidentiality um, but it's important yeah the one question um which came in um uh, from from a gentleman who was asking um you know he's been really struggling with with ed um he had his prostate removed uh, back in june uh, and they save the nerves, but even with tablets, he can only best really achieve a, sort of a half hard erection. Um, you know, he, he's counts himself very lucky to be in a, a sort of new relationship with a very wonderful, uh, a very wonderful woman. Um, but he he's struggling with the fact that he doesn't feel a whole man. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to that and, and you know what advice yeah. you might be able to give to him. So it was June. It probably seems like a lifetime to you. It's very early still from surgery. Um, and I would be moving on if you haven't moved on to something like an injection, because you could potentially inject if there's no contraindication of any of the things that you're taking and, and carry on with a low daily dose if you're not doing that or stop it and use injections and retry tablets again in a few months time, because I like to say three month time frames are more manageable. So it was June and we're only just into December. To be honest, the fact you are getting the erection that you are getting now is very good because it's, it was interesting when you said half. I use a um, scale, it's called an erection hardening score. There it is, one to four. And it's a good way. One is penis is larger, but not hard. Two, it's hard, but not hard enough for penetration. Three, hard enough for penetration, but not completely hard. And four, completely hard and fully rigid. And most men pre-surgery, if they've not got a problem, will be three to four. So you saying I'm sort of there, I'm half, you know, actually using this grading system helps you realize how good is what I've got for my sexual activity. It sounds like you probably need to move on to another treatment and maybe use a vacuum as well with a ring, which will hold it, but also talk to somebody about how that's making you feel. Uh, we have a couple of questions came in around um, is there any risk um, of of having sex or sexual activity um, whether you know by yourself or with others um, lessening the effect of of treatment like hormone treatment um, no. or, or you know can it make residual cancer worse after radiation no not at all it's interesting actually somebody mentioned that to me last week and I've not had anybody ask that. Occasionally I might get the odd man pulls right up across the tech to me ask me. And no, you won't. Not at all. It's really, really safe to be sexually active. There's actually a study um, done in Kefili, and it was about the number of people who have orgasms. And the more orgasms we have, the longer we can live for. And physiologically, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to. And mentally and psychologically, there isn't as well. So um, go for it. Absolutely. Um, uh, are pelvic floor exercises the only way to treat uh, climacturia or are there any other treatment methods that are more effective? 
Um, no, you're right. Pla um, pelvic floor exercises don't always fix that problem. It can get better over time. Um, and no, there isn't. It really is doing pelvic floor. They're also known as Kegel exercises for some people who might be a bit confused. But um, it's a thing that hopefully will improve over time. It can be very bad at the beginning for some people and then resolve. Um, a, lot, a lot of questions asking when, when will this recording be available? Um, it will be available uh, within the next few days, um, you know, poss possibly uh, early next week. But everyone who attended um, will automatically get an email from, from Zoom with a link to the recording. And it will be going up on our website just to let you know. Um, uh, quite a few questions coming in, Lorraine, about um, uh, who who exactly um, should someone be be speaking to. So, so uh, one one gentleman asked, um, you know, I, I'd spoken to my uh, oncologist, I'd spoken to my urologist, um, but uh, it, it, I, I have no idea where to go or who to speak to. Um, and you know, are they the right people? Um, and then an another question came in asking. Um, Someone had asked about um, just finding the, the name of the drug that they asked about, and we were told it was on a blacklist. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and that's what I was saying. You know, when I said about the postcode lottery, um, that sadly is what is becoming the case that in primary care, the, um, the community pharmacy team are often managing what goes on lists and it can be blacklisted. I'm, I hate it when this happens because it shouldn't be at all. And I tell you what, until the day I die, I will be fighting that men have access to these things. And you need, it needs to, you know, it's a human right. <laughs> and it's prostate cancer that you're managing. So unfortunately, this is happening and it's happening more frequently. I would say the last six months, it has got a lot worse. Um, so that's very annoying. And patients may have to purchase it themselves, which is very sad. Um, the clinical nurse specialists, so I used to be what you would call a clinical nurse specialist in erectile dysfunction. So I was somebody that saw people just for ED. But clinical nurse specialist in prostate cancer, you may have a named nurse, senior nurse that's attached to your case. And hopefully they will be able to direct you. I mean, I have to say Zoom has opened up a lot for people to be able to access speaking to specialists. And, that, and that's something that I feel strongly about. I think, I, I believe a psychosexual therapy should be part of the multidisciplinary team. And that's something that I next year, I've been saying it for quite a while now, but I'm absolutely adamant to try and bring about change. Because if we've got patients unmet needs, how are we going to change it? And we keep hearing about unmet needs. We have for many years. And I think the change has to be some people, team of people who are comfortable talking about sexuality with patients. We would not expect a surgeon, you know, if someone said to me, go and do that radical prostatectomy, that's without my boundary of professional accountability. So we all have a role. And so at the moment, it, I would probably speak to your CNS and see if they can direct you. The College of Sexual and Relationship Therapists is the college that I belong to. And there's a list of therapists all around the country, including Relate who do psychosexual therapy. Um, so, you know, there are signposting people around the country is an important factor of that. There's over 670 sex therapists in the UK. And most people always go, oh, I don't know where they are. Unfortunately, they're not always available on the NHS. Some sexual health clinics may have um, a sex therapist as one of their sexual health advisors. But sadly, there's been a lot of change with that over the years as well. Um, so in a nutshell, CNS, and I'm sorry to hear about the blacklist. And um, it's a very difficult one to manage that. Yeah. Um, is there, there was a question around uh, Sildena, uh, my pronunciation, Sildena, Sildenafil. Thank you very much for saving me. Uh, it being often prescribed, but can it have side effects like indigestion, uh, asked one person. Um, and are there alternative drugs that, that have similar or other side effects? And, and are they available <laughs> often on the NHS? Brilliant question. Sildenafil, 
the Tadalafil, Cialis, Avanafil and Spedra, they can all cause indigestion. But between the different drugs, it can be worse with one drug than another. So they all have generally facial flushing, indigestion, stuffy nose, rhinitis, they call that, or a headache. They're the general side effects, but they can differ between them. So I always say move on to another drug if you're finding the side effect isn't tolerable. With sildenafil, some people get a bluey green vision because it latches onto PDE6 in your retina of your eye. PD5 is in the muscle, of, is in the structure of the tissue that I spoke about earlier on, PD5 inhibitors. And with Tadalafil, Cialis, that can latch on to PD11, which is in muscle. So some people on Cialis, Tadalafil, get backache or lower leg ache, and they'll feel like they've got flu. And then I'll say, if it's that bad, stop it. If you continue with the drug, sometimes the side effects can dissipate. But if the side effect continues, you're far better to switch to another drug. And in case it's a case of trial and error and just see if you still get the indigestion with the other PD5 that you try. I'm conscious, obviously, we've gone over a little bit. If, um, if it's all right with you, Lorraine, I, I don't know if you have somewhere to be or if you have a few more minutes, we're just trying. Yeah, to no, through. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and thank you everyone for all your questions that are coming in. Um, uh, one gentleman asking, he's um, on active surveillance but suffers from ED. Um, in, in his situation, what, what do you think would be the best sort of treatment for, for someone who's um, still on active surveillance but suffering from ED? Um, well, that thing about risk factors, you might be on active surveillance but you've got ED. What could be the cause of that? So get yourself, what are your lipid levels? What's your thyroid doing? You're not diabetic, you know, so make sure you're okay with that. Start off with a PD5 inhibitor, a tablet. If you've not got any medication that you're already taking, that would be a contraindication to using it. Um, most men will try a tablet first line. I mean, also be mindful of what's going on in your life anyway, you know, as to what psychologically that overlapping of things. But starting off with the tablets is usually the easiest thing to do. Um, I always say as well, try and live with masturbation. You know exactly where you like to be touched, where you like to be held to get the best arousal, to feel relaxed. Because if you're with a partner, or a new date that you're going to be sexually intimate with and try and tablets for the first time, that adds in performance anxiety. And I, I understand with some cultures that actually masturbation may be frowned upon, but if you're thinking about this as a medical reason why you're doing this, which you, you are, um, some people say, you know what, I'm able to do it in the boundary of that setting. Um, so I would start with tablets. Thank you for that. And, um... In terms of some daily exercises, um, there have been some questions around masturbation. Um, one gentleman asking, you know, I don't have a partner, so it, would you sort of recommend masturbation as a, as a daily exercise to help keep the tissue supple? Um, and then uh, someone else actually perhaps on the opposite side of that saying, um, you know, they, they masturbate quite a lot um, in order to try to help, um, but they find it's sort of interrupting their sleeping pattern. Um, you know, is this normal or also would you recommend um, sort of maybe rethinking how, how they're approaching masturbation for this? Yeah, yeah that's right. So in porn, porn is so freely available nowadays and how people access it. And so frequent, frequent masturbation, if it's, there are many reasons why we do it. And if it's frequent masturbation to get to sleep, or you're using it as an exerciser, but you're only associating, trying to get an erection with it, you sort of lose, the, you lose arousal in a way that's around sex. It becomes more of a tick box to do that. So I would always pick out a bit more with the masturbation. Why are you doing and what you're doing it for? So we've got that side of it. We've also got the side, well, if I have no partner and I've had prostate cancer, my treatment needs, I need to be trying to keep my penis erect. Of course, it might be that you're using masturbation, but you may use something like a vacuum device or you may use your hand. And then depending on the outcome of how good the erection is, you'll either carry on doing it with your hand or carry on using it with a vacuum. If you then form a relationship, 
and you've been used to being touched on your penis in a certain way by yourself or your vacuum, you sort of disassociate then being intimate with someone and them touching you. So there's all sorts of things around masturbation, but generally it's a really healthy thing to do. I would recommend it. If daily seems too much and it's not doing your head any favours or it's too onerous, you're working and it feels like if I'm not doing it, it's a negative, maybe doing it two or three times a week or just look at when you can do it and at what time of day and the frequency. So there's lots of questions there really that I'd be asking a little bit more about. Um, but generally it's a really good thing to do for men and women. Uh, one gentleman's asking, he uh, had unilateral nerve sparing at the time of his prostatectomy. Um, and since then uh, did have a slight recovery of, of erection over the next few months, but then had to go and have radiotherapy to his mm -hmm. prostate bed. And his consultant said, you know, that would set him back considerably. Um, he does take uh, twice weekly to, da to Dalafil and has been using a pump for about two years to keep his tissues supple. Um, but, but do you know if it's true that nerves can recover from radiation damage with time? Or yeah, it yeah, it can. It can take a long time. It's variable. I don't think we know enough about statistics of that sort of thing, but they can. Interesting when you said he takes a tablet twice a week. There seems to be a bit of a thing where people get told to take a tablet twice a week. And I always say, why and when? The tablets work with sexual stimulation. So if you're taking the tablets and not having sexual stimulation, why are you taking, you know, what outcome do you expect to see? The daily dose and or is the methodology is at night whilst you're sleeping, you get five to six erections at night and you get morning erections. So you're trying to mimic and getting the tablets to work and giving men nighttime erections. So taking the tablets when they're not associated to a sexual stimulation may not always be the best way of taking it. And you're right, the radiotherapy can then have an impact on the recovery that there's been from surgery. So you get sudden loss post-surgery and a gradual improvement. You have radiotherapy and you have a gradual deterioration sometimes. So sort of there's a line crossing over. And you, you know, you're doing quite right by saying I'm using my vacuum, but maybe now is the time that you might want to think about moving on from the tablets and using something else to give you a better outcome. Because also, say you use an injection and that gives you a nice grade three to four erection and you can wank or whatever word you feel comfortable using, because that's an important part of, of your discussion and communication. But actually, if I can get a nice warm erection with an injection, fully hard and rigid, I might prefer to do that than use my vacuum where it's a bit cooler and it only stays there with the ring on. So it could be you moving on to trying some other things. If there's further recovery over time, go back to trying tablets or see if you get some spontaneous erections. And this is the point, it's not a set thing. It's a spectrum of time and it's a spectrum of treatment options and trying, yeah. And, and I think you probably answered this in, um, just then as well, but uh, a, a part of it anyway is what one gen gentleman was asking, is there any harm in taking uh, sort so, of <laughs> Thank you. Not going to get that one today. Uh, on an ad hoc basis, um, are you taking it for a while, then stop taking it, then maybe restarting? Uh, and, and if it you know, doesn't make sense, is that, so what dose would you recommend it being taken on on a daily basis? So um, sildenafil, its half-life is four to six hours. It's a smaller window it's there for. Tadalafil is longer. We've got a 24 to 36 hour frame. So if you're taking sildenafil, the original trials that Pfizer did were 25 milligrams of sildenafil every night when a man went to bed. So you'd have peaks and troughs with timing because over that four to six hours, it would dissipate the drug. So if you're taking it ad hoc, it would be 100 milligram, which is the maximum dose because most men following treatment for prostate cancer do need the maximum dose. So it's 100 sildenafil, which equates to a 20 milligram to dalafil. So if you're doing it ad hoc, I would take 100 milligram sildenafil ad hoc with sexual stimulation. If you find that isn't working as well as you want, you could try to dalafil because this is the slight differences that can occur. And Levitra 
um, which is Vardenafil, which was the third of the tablets to be developed. I've had some then where they've tried both the others and then they've gone on to Vardenafil and Vardenafil's worked for them. If you're really, you know, if you say, I just don't want to try a pellet or an injection, there is some manoeuvrability. Generally, they do work similarly, but occasionally you'll get these slight variations. So ad hoc sildenafil, I would do 100 milligram. And I've got time. I think we're going to do two more questions and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Um, one gentleman was asking, how can you find out whether the issue with arousal is, is mental, physical or, or medical? Oh, good question. Just think about, does it happen all the time? Does it happen when you're on your own? What sort of things could stop you from, are you stressed? When you say arousal, is that you getting the erection? Is it reaching an orgasm? Is it having the desire initially to get aroused, to have that desire starting? There are so many questions that I've got there. But if it's all the time, what are the maintenance factors? Is it you've had, you know, your definition of arousal? Is it being aroused? Is it getting an erection? Is it, is it since your treatment? Is it since your diagnosis? Is it constant? Is it intermittent? There are those sort of questions that I want to know a little bit more about. There's a great book called The New Male Sexuality I've referenced, um, and you can get it on Amazon. And it's a good book, and it has all sorts of stuff in about men and sex and arousal, erections, orgasm. So that's a good one, yeah. And the uh, very last question, and, and just, uh, I know there are a few more questions out there. What, what I'll do, if it's all right with Lorraine, is I'll, I'm gonna send her an email with, with the questions and then I'll get back to, uh, yeah, to where, where there's, um, we don't have time to do so today. Um, th this last one is um, one gentleman asking, since having radiation treatment, uh, when ejaculating, he feels like he's going to urinate. Um, and you know, do you have any advice for what to do in that situation? You could use a condom and um, put that if you're firm enough to get a condom on that will catch the urine within it. If you feel like it's going to happen, you may feel like it for some irritation maybe within the urethra, but it doesn't happen. Um, and if it does happen, urine is, urine is sterile. Um, and as I said, that actually just, you know, having lay down with a towel, um, and having a flannel of some nice warm soapy water with some suds in that you can just freshen yourself up um, that can help if it does happen but I've certainly had men use condoms if there's been um, a significant amount that they felt uncomfortable about um, brilliant well Lorraine thank you so much uh, for your time today and on behalf of, of everyone who's sent in um, you know Thanks for, for you know, what you shared with us. Um, you know, it's, it's been really great. And thank you, uh, yeah. everyone. Thank you, everyone who joined today and for all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get around to all of them, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to get answers to you uh, by email um, where, where I'm able to. Um, so that wraps it up from us. Um, there is a, a, a post uh, webinar survey. Um, please do, if you have a moment, um, you know, if you could just fill that in. And that also includes. Uh, any suggestions on what you think we could do for our next season of uh, Living Well with Prostate Cancer? Hopefully this has opened up some thoughts um, in, in your mind as to maybe other areas that we're able to support you. Um, and hopefully maybe we can do something again with Lorraine uh, in, in the future. So thanks all. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Lorraine. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.